So um, I am go ahead and start. I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us today for uh, this UCSF Department of Psychiatry Town Hall on well-being. Um, as the pandemic wears on, uh, we all know, I think, that the challenges to everyone's emotional health and well-being uh, grows more burdensome each day for all of us. Um, I have to say, as I have before, that I remain incredibly proud of the work that our department um, continues to do to sustain our operations, uh, serve our patients, educate our learners, uh, sustain our research as best we can, um, and to not only continue, but to expand our care for some of the most vulnerable residents in San Francisco. Um, and on top of all that, uh, the department has stepped up remarkably um, uh, to provide uh, an array of resources as part of our COVID-19 response, from caring for the caregiver um, in collaboration uh, with um, uh, a, a wide variety of folks uh, at UCSF Health, uh, to developing the department's uh, mental health resource website, to our video shorts, to our webinars, tip sheets, uh, just to name a few examples, um, and very recently launching in partnership with UCSF Human Resources and the Center for Digital Health Innovation, uh, the UCSF Employee Coping and Resiliency Program, uh, which among uh, a variety of things is offering direct clinical care to all UCSF employees who wish uh, to access this service. And I, I encourage everyone who feels that they might need or want additional support right now that goes beyond what we're able to get from a website um, or um, uh, peer support uh, to reach out. Uh, we're there. Um, uh, we've set up the program. The response has been remarkable, um, uh, and uh, and I think there's no more important time for people to take care of themselves. So today, I'm delighted in that vein to be able to focus our town hall on well-being, and we have three wonderful presenters today: uh, Christina Mangurian, Keith Armstrong, and Margot Kumar. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Alyssa Eppel, our vice chair for adult psychology, who will tell us more about our speakers uh, in today's program. Alyssa has not only been a key leader in our department and across UCSF in addressing stress and resilience in the age of COVID, um, but also working tirelessly to create, curate, um, uh, and communicate uh, resources for emotional health and well-being nationally. And this is on top of her day job leading a world-class research program on mechanisms of healthy aging. Couldn't be more grateful for the work that you've been doing, Alyssa, and I'm going to hand it over to you now. Um, uh, to take us through today's program. Thank you so much, Matt. That, that's so nice. I am just delighted that you guys have joined us. We have an hour together and it's packed. And this is really a time actually to, um, to be together as much as we can as a department. We are going to have a, a chat that everyone can see and we want your questions after each talk. And then I will call on, on some people to go live and, and we want to see your face, we want to hear your voice. So this is a time that we can actually have um, some, uh, you know, simulation of togetherness. We're going to go oh, about our resources. We have, um, please look at our video library. It has really grown in the last week. I'm just so delighted to see what people have created on their own in their, um, Homes, we have this like phenomenal breadth of expertise. Look at it. Maybe you want to contribute one. It, we've already had a thousand different people look at our video shorts, and it's only been up this past week. Um, our our website has been looked at. Our coping website by um, around one uh, one hundred thousand different people. So we're clearly serving a need out there. It's it's wonderful to. Um, have our department be able to play such a virtual role. So today, this town hall is for all of us. We have a very diverse department, teaching, research, clinical, admin, staff. We really want to think about, you know, not um, just wellness for ourselves and wellness in our workplaces. We are in this position for a while. We are working in this weird virtual world. We're going to be slowly released. We might need to come back to our homes in the fall. We just don't know, right? So we really want to think about this is life. Life is not on hold. This is our new reality for now. And what do we need to do to get into a healthy pace of wellness every day? So uh, you're going to hear practical information about building resilience. We have three expert panelists from our department. We have a department of experts as well. So I just want to encourage you as you uh, think about chatting in a question, 
please share an insight, share your own advice. Like let's use the wealth of our expertise here. It's a moment where we can actually feel and see what others are thinking. So that's a, a lovely um, experiment we're gonna do with Zoom. So we're gonna hear about Coke last from Christina. And then after her presentation, we'll have about uh, at least 15 minutes for a general discussion. So first I'm thrilled to have Keith Armstrong join us. He is a professor based at the VA. He's the strategic partnership officer, uh, director of couples and family therapy at the VA, associate chief of mental health, and here's what is phenomenal. For the past 30 years, he has coordinated disaster mental health responses in so many different contexts. He's partnered with Red Cross and has uh, coordinated volunteers, mental health professionals after the Loma Prieta earthquake, after the Northridge earthquake, after the Oakland Fire Hills. So we're just so lucky to get to hear from him, to have him in our department. He's also um, co-author of two best-selling books, Courage After Fire, Coping Strategies for Troops, and Courage After Fire for Parents. Welcome, Keith. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alyssa. That was really lovely. Um, all right. Well, let's start. So I have a confession to make. This is the first worldwide pandemic that I've lived through. Although I have 30 years of experience in responding to natural and man-made disasters, I want to offer my suggestions, ideas, and strategies with a large dose of humility. Everything is moving so quickly. The idea of shelter in place is just so last week. Please keep that in mind. We are simultaneously refining our ideas and strategies while tracking a moving target, which is not an easy task. While for many of us, the adrenaline rush of the early phase of the pandemic has passed, now our friends, irritability and exhaustion have come to visit and are more prominent. While this isn't exactly equivalent to being in war, there's a component of exhaustion, the thousand yard stare that occurs in prolonged combat where attention, concentration, and energy are all depleted. Discussing this topic in a short time is ambitious and will not do justice to the complexity of the situation we continue to be facing. My focus will be on strategies and ideas to help reduce psychiatric symptoms individually, on our work teams, and in our homes. These strategies can be utilized in a variety of environments that we inhabit. And I want to acknowledge the very different socioeconomic environments in which we live. The helpful idea, for example, that a bedroom should only be used for sleeping isn't necessarily a useful strategy if it's the only room you have in which to both work and sleep. COVID-19 is different from anything we've previously experienced because unlike an earthquake or a flood, this pandemic is happening to all of us in real time, continuing to unfold as I speak and you listen. We respond to an earthquake after the shaking stops, but with this pandemic, there's no completely safe place for any of us right now. There's no definitive end in sight. There's no distinction between helpers and survivors. And as of now, there are no guarantees. But we do have each other. And for the duration of the pandemic, it'll take the entire village. We are running an ultra marathon that we didn't choose to run. And our pace will vary individually as both professional and situation shift. And what about the reopening that's on the horizon? where some of us have made adjustments to our lives, but are now having to reorganize home and work life again because it's time to go back. Will loosening restrictions put healthcare workers and their families more at risk? And how do we handle the anxiety and fear that will come along with opening things up? Unfortunately, our typical solutions to mitigate stress, anxiety, and fear may not be achieved in the ways that we're biologically wired to achieve them. A hug, a touch, being in the close physical presence of a significant other, to help soothe our anxieties, to remind us that we're not alone. So we must improvise. The good news is that human beings are good at improvising, taking a problem and designing a solution. The bad news is that we're also creatures of habit. It can be extremely distressing and disorienting if our go-to strategies, what we know can ease our fears, actually place us at higher risk, as is the case with COVID-19. One goal to help mitigate the psychological impact of this disaster is to create as much safety as possible. But how do we create a psychologically safer environment in the physically, socially, and economically unsafe landscape of a pandemic? Most of what I 
I'm about to say, tries to adhere to the Goldilocks formula. Not too much, not too little. Something that hopefully is just right. I have four areas to cover. First, we must stay connected. When communities all go through an event together, there is less likelihood of long-term psychological problems. We must stay connected. So work to maintain your connection with those who are important to you and allow them to maintain their connection with you. This could be by phone, email, letters, video, or at a socially appropriate distance. And hug those you are sheltering in place with who consent to being hugged. I said it that way because I've got a teenage daughter. You gotta be careful about those things. Um, listen, reflect, and validate. Help others be and feel seen and heard. Demonstrate kindness and support, especially around irritability, which is now more prominent than at the beginning. Approach irritability with curiosity rather than withdrawal. Allow for venting and vent, but don't push too hard for others to be vulnerable. It may not be safe enough for them yet. And express appreciation for the personal sacrifices that others are making. We're all making sacrifices of some kind right now. Second, strong leadership is critical. As a leader, be a role model. Role model getting help and taking care of yourself. Implement and integrate self-care activities for your teams. Make self-care a part of the job. Demonstrate flexibility and creative problem solving. Follow through. Doing what you say you are going to do helps create safety and trust and also establishes follow through as an expectation for those around you. Acknowledge the issues and challenges rather than denying or downplaying them. Model transparency. Be aware that you, your staff, and your family may, as the pandemic continues to unfold, experience profound guilt. Asking the question, did I do enough to help others during this disaster? How do I relate to or support my colleagues in hotspots across the country? How can I complain when so many people in New York are sick or dying? Expect these questions to be asked during the pandemic and help model thoughtful responses, which include all of the different aspects that this disaster has touched. It's not just about work, it's about home life too. Third, communicate and do it well. Be clear and concise. Expect that others will ask questions, Try to limit your own defensiveness. When you need to pivot, explain why. Decisions will be made during this time that not everyone will agree with. You need to have a clear rationale when important decisions are made and communicate that rationale. Find the sweet spot of information sharing. Not too much, not too little. One page handouts are something that we've done a fair amount at the VA. And Nick, or if you've got an opportunity to flash up what we're doing. Um, and these are available on the COVID, the UC COVID uh, website. So thank you. That's great. Let me see if I can now pull up the rest of my presentation here. All right. Thank you. Great. That's great. So finally, Remember that you too are human, strong but not invincible. These are not normal circumstances, not normal, not normal at home, at work, or in your communities. This is survival mode. Set a realistic bar for yourself and your family. Pay attention to what works in helping to alleviate your anxiety and your family's anxiety and be prepared for times when they just don't simply line up. Maintain routines as much as you can. Develop or maintain rituals that you can count on happening. It could be a regular dose of self-care like meditating or connecting with family at a particular time, or it could be something else. Use humor and distraction as strategies to combat anxiety or depression. Exercise, or as I might say, move your body any way you can do it. Create meaning. This is bigger than all of us. How can you, in addition to sheltering in place, which is a big contribution, continue to make a difference that you will be proud of what do you want your contribution to look like? And get help if you need it. If you've got significant sleep, anxiety, or depression symptoms, get help. If you're on medications and not doing well, make an appointment with your provider. As Andrew Solomon recently said, it's okay to increase your medication during this incredibly stressful time. So in closing, connect with others and allow them to connect with you. 
Be kind and receive kindness with grace. Lead with humility. Communicate clearly and gently ask for clarification when the communication to you is not clear. Set the bar at the Goldilocks height for yourself and your family in determining what success looks like. And above all else, survive. Thank you. Keith, thank you so much. That was absolutely beautiful and so rich. And I think we want to transcript. <laughs> um, luckily, we have this on video. So uh, people feel free to type in your questions. I'll start with a question from me. Um, Keith, I've been actually wanting to ask you this. You know, we learned so much from our VA colleagues about um, disaster mental health. And um, as a, I was trained as a clinical psychologist, and what I understand is that um, what we do for long-term trauma and PTSD like CBT and our therapies are really not appropriate in a disaster mental health context, in an acute context. Mm -hmm. Where are we at now? Are we, you know, we don't want people to process trauma too deeply. Right. What, besides support, what are the recommended modalities of support for people who, have, who are feeling trauma? You know, I mean, I think that that was really why I, I focused uh, at least a little bit on attachment, because I really think it is the experience of um, knowing that you're not in this uh, alone, that having reactions is normal. Now, again, again, this is, as I said, as I said in the talk, this is such a new area. So for, we're all learning. I mean, typically people go through a disaster, they go through some major issue and then it's safe and then they can process what they went through here we are in the middle of this so it's very difficult to prescribe exactly the kinds of things that we should do but i think staying connected educating people that generally speaking and again this is a general comment it's not you know meant for everybody that having strong reactions to this experience is absolutely spot on you'd be kind of out of your mind if you didn't have some sort of reaction, if you weren't exhausted at this point, if you know the waxing and waning of, of arousal symptoms didn't come up. So all of that is, you know, is I think part of the, the territory. Um, I think some discussion of what people are going through without delving in too deeply probably is a good strategy. And just you know, generally helping people feel that they're I mean, the good news, again, as I said earlier, is that, is that when communities go through horrible events, they tend to do better than when it's an individual event. Now, again, there are a lot of caveats to that. You know, if, if, you, know, if, the, uh, um, if you, you, know, you don't have PPE, then the quote unquote natural disaster becomes really a man-made slash natural disaster. And that can lead to longer term problems, for instance. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think um, that really it's the, the important piece is really being with others and um, obtaining support and providing support for those folks. That's such a beautiful answer. Thank you. That brings us to our next question. Christina, can you um, share your question about Zoom? Sure. It's just kind of a, a question uh, built off of what you were saying. You, you had so many pearls that you just dropped during your talk, and one of them was trying to stay connected. And I noticed that in a lot of my meetings at Zoom, I too sometimes will turn off my video, right? I'm, I'm meeting lunch, I don't yeah. want anybody to see or whatever I'm doing. But I'm wondering in connectedness, kind of what you're doing actively and encouraging your staff to do regarding Zoom and Zoom video. Um, and whether we should be encouraging that more with groups that are small. Obviously, with this, it's very hard. There's, I don't even know how many people are on the call now. But what are your thoughts about smaller groups? You know, it's it's such a it's such a good question. I mean, I I've been and and again, this isn't uh, this isn't something that I've done. Um, I think with a tremendous amount of thought, but I've. I've alternated. I've had, you know, a certain amount of Zoom meetings with students, um, and then with other students or colleagues or patients. Um, some of which I've done on Zoom, or we have VA Video Connect. But some of which I've I've kept to um, phone, uh, phone contacts, and I think it works. I mean, again, I, this is not my area of expertise, but it works different parts of my brain. I listen differently 
to um, to my phone calls and my the patients that I'm talking with on the phone or the, the my trainees very differently than I do if I'm looking at them. Yeah. And, um, and so, so I, and, and I'm not sure if I'm doing that because I'm just worn out by the amount of video or if I'm doing, I'm, not, I'm like, I haven't quite, I don't quite know, but I think some kind of combination of both video and telephone work, I think um, probably is uh, good to do. And, and to notice like, are you feeling less, sharp if you're using one technology as yep. opposed to another and and is it okay to swap it out a little bit and to try something different i mean i think that that's not a bad strategy thank you so much um we can continue with questions for keith um in our discussion at the end that was extremely illuminating i think we're all still chewing on this idea of how to use how to use Zoom well and not overuse it the, the fatigue for clinicians reading emotion signals at the same time as the metacognition they need to have is depleted. I think it is depleted and exhausting. I want to encourage everyone before we move to Margo to turn off your video and move, drink, eat. This is lunchtime. You probably are going right into another meeting after this. Uh, and walks, you know, having phone time meetings while you walk is great when you don't have to be on Zoom and be looking at things together. Okay, so I'd love to introduce Margot Pumar, who is an associate clinical professor of psychiatry. She's the associate medical director for integration and collaborative care. Um, she has early in her career developed mental health programs in Africa that has led her to really focus on integration of behavioral health and physical health sciences across UCSF. She has uh, leadership roles in uh, special interventions for wellness across UCSF right now. She's extremely busy developing town halls for different departments as well as her clinical practice. Welcome, Margo. You're muted. You're still muted. Sorry, I apologize. I'm getting my, my Zoom is not working well. Great, okay. Thanks for your patience with that. Um, well, I'm really excited to be with you guys today. Um, I, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you. Uh, as, as Alyssa said, um, I've been traveling around uh, UCSF doing town halls, virtually, obviously. Um, and so it's really, it's such a pleasure to be here with you all today um, because it's, I've, I've got so much out of connecting with all of these other different groups and creating spaces for them to come together in their town halls and talk about um, their shared experiences and connecting in this way. And so it's really, it's really special for me to get to do this with my own colleagues. Um, we share similar passions of trying to figure out ways to help our, our patients um, when they are sort of at their most emotionally and mentally vulnerable. And that comes with kind of specific challenges for all of us. Um, I um, have a lot of overlap in some of the things that I'm gonna say that Keith said, um, but I wanna offer you some ideas and a framework. And I wanna kind of create some space for us to think about um, what we've been experiencing and how we might use that framework with our patients as well. So first, um, in, in my time today, I want to stop and look at the world that coronavirus has created for us. And then I want to sort of think about how we're surviving in this. Um, I pulled this, this directly from a TV show, so I'm not, the, the irony of the outwit, outplay, outlast is not lost on me in the terms of coronavirus. Um, which I think we're struggling to do, all of those things. And despite that, I still want to offer the idea of not just surviving, but thriving. And for those of you who might, um, the idea of thriving just sounds overwhelming. Um, I'll offer some other ways to engage with that idea. So this is our world. 
in many ways. Um, I, I've, I've shown this slide to other people and they usually say, Margo, I don't like this slide. It's really overwhelming. Um, but this is our life. You know, we have millions of children that should be in school and are at home. The data as of yesterday is that we have 33.5 million unemployed people in our country. Um, checking this number weekly is usually the thing that brings me to tears. And with all of this stress and financial stress and people being kind of home together, um, we know that there's a rise in drinking. Alcohol sales have more than doubled during the pandemic. There's an increase in um, interpersonal violence and risk for it. Um, we struggle with basic things like how do we get our needs met and get toilet paper while our healthcare workers um, are faced with shortages of everything from swabs to PPE to ventilators. And even in some places we read about um, shortage of morgues. Um, and we are facing all of this um, by doing as what Keith said, you know, trying to connect um, over these flat devices. Um, and with that comes so many different emotions and many of them really negative and difficult. Um, and they've changed over time. Um, but I think the ones that are, that are growing and have stayed with us are the uncertainty and the worry. I have the privilege of being married to an infectious disease doctor who's working um, on the front lines of developing contact tracing. And so um, I generally know the latest information and I'm still constantly stunned by the fact that there is just so much that we do not know about this virus or what it's gonna take to get us back to some semblance of normal. And so, um, you know, as Keith said, we, we worked really hard and we're running off adrenaline and a lot of us are just burnt out and exhausted now. So any good uh, survival show will tell you that you need to kind of take stock of your basic resources and, um, and sort of think about what you have. And so I'm putting up Maslow's hierarchy of needs to sort of think, you know, how do we take stock of each aspect of our lives? Um, and I like this because it's something I can, I can talk about with patients or I can put them up a picture of this and think about how they can check in with each area of their lives. Um, and so everybody has had to redo their routines from the most basic level of, um, you know, I don't leave the house, so when do I shower, or brush my teeth? Um, safety is now all about distance. Um, and yet we are desperately longing for love and, and belonging and having to learn all of these new technologies. Um, you know, not being at our normal place of work, so we miss out on ways that we Get to experience respect and recognition and things that make us feel good um, and for many people thinking about who we are becoming is not even on the list but for me doing many of these town halls across UCSF and talking with people this is the part that keeps me going this is the part that inspires me this is the place where I feel like I've experienced huge privilege getting to hear people's stories. Um, and so, you know, many of the things that we're doing that might be inspiring are not necessarily going to make headlines. Um, but I do think of my patient last week who told me her whole story of um, trying to get on um, with her therapist and she could not have any digital privacy from her partner and, um, and had been suffering other abuse and sort of finally called her family and her, her spouse's family and said, come get him. I have had enough. I'm not going to live this way anymore and neither are my kids. Um, and that incredible bravery is inspiring for librarians who are turning into contact tracers all across California and the US. This is their Dunkirk moment where um, they might not be taking out their boats, but they're pulling out their phones and they're um, helping us to think about how we could possibly get back to a normal life. Um, for many of us, um, the best we can do in terms of thriving is just be aware of there are some silver linings out there. I'm 
I'm sure some of you have watched some good news or have heard about the dolphins in the Venice Canal or the fact that there are no more dogs to adopt. Um, and these are wonderful things. But I think there are also others of us who are um, at the end of our rope or we're already at the end of the rope when the pandemic hit and are just wondering how they're gonna make it day by day. And so I encourage you to take this time where there's some quiet um, and there's less stuff um, because I, you know, I agree with what Elizabeth Kubler-Ross said, which is the most beautiful people I've known are those who have known trials and have known struggles, have known loss and have found their way out of the depths. Um, you all are an amazing group of people um, and I'm so grateful to have this time for you. And um, I would love for in our question time just to hear a little bit from you guys. And I'll leave you with, and the world came together as people stayed apart and say thank you to all of the healthcare workers. Thank you, Margo, so much. Um, Margo is tough and doesn't cry for herself, but she makes me cry a lot. So at the beginning of working together, Christine and Margo and I have been meeting regularly. And one day she um, was disappointed with herself because she hadn't met our weekly goal. And then we found out, I, you know, I just met a, a benefit as I've met you through this month, through this pandemic, but I've learned that she has young children at home, that she was supposed to homeschool. She has a husband who is, as you heard, an MD who's out there in the field, and she is doing a phenomenal job. And so like doing what you can is amazing. And that's all we can do. And I just... I'm so grateful to you. I know how hard you work. Your kids have been back at home. You thought your husband was infected. Thank God he's not. But it's been a roller coaster. And um, you are a frontline worker. By, by video, but still, it's intense. And I appreciate you. Okay, so I cried. Uh, my threshold for crying is down here, but I am also having a lot of um, positive emotions too, just, to, just for the record. Um, so let's have some uh, questions from other people for Margot. Okay, we'll give you more time. We'll have more time after Christina for our questions. So it is really an honor to introduce Christina Mangarians, who most of you know. She's a professor of psychiatry, epidemiology, and biostatistics. Vice Chair for Diversity and Health Equity in our department. Um, she is one of the most phenomenal people I have met at UCSF. She's also a um, uh, winner of the UCSF Mentor Award, uh, winner of the Chancellor's Award for the Advancement of Women. She's the reason that I um, applied for the Vice Chair job of psychology. So thank you for encouraging me for applying. It's been such an amazing way to um, be engaged and involved with all these wonderful people I've met. Thank you. Um, Alyssa, I can't um, thank you so much uh, for that incredibly kind introduction. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's our benefit to have you as um, our vice chair for adult psychiatry. You've been just wonderful. So can, can folks see this screen okay? I'm just making sure we have it right. Um, I, uh, I just want to know, as, as Alyssa mentioned, um, many of you know that health equity is a major component of my leadership role. Right, um, but um, it's also a major part of my identity as a physician scientist working at ZSFG. And I know this pandemic is affecting us in different ways. It's also exposing and exacerbating major social inequities across the country and the world. So I'm really proud today to be able to talk about a program that reaches all employees at UCSF, regardless of their role at the institution at all of our sites and provides mental health and well-being resources that we all deserve. Um, so next slide, let's see. So I'm not sure how many folks have seen this uh, slide before, but this is um, the source that I know of it is from Dr. Victor Sang. He's a, a pulmonary and critical care doc in Atlanta. And you can see in here, the, um, here on the y-axis, this is the health footprint and the axis is the time. And then this is the immediate impact of morbidity and mortality from COVID-19. 
green, this kind of purple. Then there's the impact on resources in green, um, resource restriction on urgent non-COVID condition. And then there's a third wave of the impact on interrupted care on chronic conditions. And then this is one that we're all familiar familiar with, with um, mental health providers, um, the mental health impact. And as um, Margo was mentioning, you know, this is a, this is a major trauma, you know, whether you're getting impacted by um, somebody having COVID-19, a loved one dying from COVID-19, the social isolation or losing your, a job, um, everybody's impacted. And I think we all know that ourselves and other mental health providers across the country have been scrambling to try to provide assistance to our brothers and sisters um, and provide continued support as we um, face this pandemic. And um, so that's a good segue into uh, UCSF COPE. And I wanna echo what um, Matt said in the beginning. Uh, this is a program for all of us, right? Um, sometimes healthcare providers are actually the most reluctant to seek care themselves. So I really encourage all of you to go to this website here or text it, it'll um, put you through a, a bot that'll help triage you to care that you might need. Um, and please refer um, any of your colleagues to it. Um, so then the, the next few minutes, I'm gonna describe actually what kind of services CO provides and how it was started. So um, uh, it's really the inspired, uh, it's inspired by the leadership of um, the incredible, you know, Dr. Maja Jackson Trish, who I think most of you know, she's our um, vice, um, she's the vice president of Adult Behavioral Health Services at UCSF Health and one of our vice chairs as well. And she had a lot of really unique experiences that ideally positioned her to lift this program up in a very short amount of time. Um, you know, we first met at the end of May or the end of March, March 23rd, and were charged with building a program to be able to have the capacity to, tr to, tr to potentially treat 24,000 employees. And just four weeks later on my on April 20th, we launched, um, and it's only really been a few weeks since we launched. Again, her unique experiences, though, were um, about being not only a really skilled administrator who'd worked in several different health care delivery systems, but also a health services researcher and somebody who'd experienced disaster in the past, and she'd been a clinician when Katrina struck. And so those experiences really helped her to view this from a population care, um, population health perspective, right? And dividing our employee populations into three buckets, right? So the one is people who need urgent care, the other who, you know, emergent care, the others are kind of those that might need an appointment to see a mental health provider pretty soon. And the third is the vast majority of us who need a lot of um, just general support to promote our, um, you know, our well-being. And she assembled this really incredible multidisciplinary team. I think Matt mentioned, you know, how lucky we've been to have Corey Jackson at Human Resources and Jerry Young at the Center for Digital Health Innovation. And then uh, Sarah Penningston has been incredible. And then you'll notice familiar faces down here, aside from Eva Turner, who refused to give me a, a, an actual picture of herself. Instead, there's a, there's a dog in a sailor suit. Um, but these were kind of our, our three teams. Um, uh, that we're working together. Um, and a unique aspect about UCSF COPE is really that any employee can enter the program at any of these different um, uh, areas of, you know, these different offerings in the platter. And I'm going to go into each of these. Um, and then they can progress to treatment. And the program is also run by mental health clinicians as part of their clinical work. Now, this is really important because in part of um, Maja's kind of vision with this was that we're also going to get burnt out too. A lot of us are diving in and that's sustainable for maybe a month to get some extra work on your plate and, and do what's needed. I'm not sure it's sustainable for the duration of what, what we don't know will be really the duration of this pandemic and how long it's going to impact us very likely to be very several months. Um, again, uh, I was working with um, Margot and Alyssa on these kind of more well-being um, uh, areas, and I'll, I'll get into this. Um, so this is a team that we led, again, a silver lining um, that I had, similar to how Alyssa mentioned, I got to work closely with these two incredible women who um, you have met here, if not 
before, it's really the silver lining to me during this epidemic. And also with all of these incredible people throughout UCSF, um, Department of Psychiatry and the university who offered their time. Um, there was also, you know, my heart is always at ZSFG at the general and the complex funding structure there and partnerships with DPH really required us to add some extra time and a subgroup kind of really thinking about ZSFG. So I'm also so appreciative of these folks who helped there as well. Um, and finally, um, we got a lot of assistance from folks inside and outside of our organization. You heard the pearls from uh, Dr. Armstrong. We also had Dr. Mockinger. Um, but also we had um, experts consultants outside of our university. So Dr. Kaysen is the president of the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies. Dr. Saul is a disaster psychiatry expert who consults for the UN and does a lot of organizational um, disaster psychiatry work. And Dr. Fiddleston is one of my colleagues in New York who's on the ground um, delivering uh, support groups early on. Uh, again, as Matt mentioned, um, you know, Dr. Pell has led this incredible um, uh, set of web-based resources. And I really encourage you all to go to the website um, to look at this, the wide array of content, if you haven't, free mental health apps. It's stuff that can really help you help your patients, resources for caring for children or elderly, loved ones, also a lot of resources for our patients, getting access to Wi-Fi, food, um, um, virtual funerals, etc. And then all of these webinars and videos. Um, and um, actually, we're developing some tips for managers, because um, I, I think it was Keith who was saying how important it is to role model and um, uh, really have, have a manager really being there who can um, uh, listen to their staff and really make sure that their concerns are heard and addressed. And these are old data. It's already gotten even used more. So you can see in, tw in April 2020, there were 60,000 site views, but I think we heard from Alyssa, it was more like 100,000. Um, 20,000 people have looked at these webinars and now almost 1,000 people have looked at the videos. And then I'll, I'll talk about the special interventions that are led by uh, Dr. Pumar. As she mentioned, she's been going around to all these different departments and offering these hour-long department or division-wide meetings um, to really help the staff know about COPE, but also um, be together and learn about ways in which they can support one another and um, build their resiliency. Um, we also have um, these resilience small groups that are possible. Um, so these are 45 minute group meetings. Again, they're open to members across sites and facilitated um, by a DOP faculty member or staff. And I'm really grateful to Kate Margolis and Matt Goldman and I who've, who are really trying to build an evaluation component into this so that we can do some continuous quality improvement and adjust um, our interventions as relevant uh, to meet the needs of our population. And then I want to do a shout out, obviously, to Michael Marcin and John Chamberlain, who have been doing an incredible job at the, COPE, I believe it's actually COPE's <laughs> clinic. Uh, John won't correct me, but I'm pretty sure it's that. Um, and this is where, you know, again, any UCSF employee can get individual treatment. Um, so that website that I mentioned before here, you know, the last data that I have is that over, you know, 2,700 people visited the website, uh, close to 1,000 answered at least one question. 10 of them were referred to emergency services to 911. That was that high risk group, right? And 149 were referred to COPE. We're also um, likely building these specialized COVID-19 treatment groups, like a group for people who are quarantined, employees who are quarantined, employees who are grieving, uh, the loss of a loved one, uh, those who have financial stress from COVID-19, or as is obvious, there's, there's clearly issues with increased alcohol and drug misuse during, during COVID-19, and so a group for that as well. Um, and finally, you know, uh, UCSF COPE is for all UCSF employees, regardless of site, but the individual care um, 
is, is available to everybody, but not to a ZSFG employee, right? Most, most of our faculty are UCSF employees based at ZSFG like me, so I could get services, but there might be a staff that's a ZSFG staff. And so one of the big things that we also build is making sure we had uh, resources that were readily available for them. So the Department of Public Health has um, set up a lot of different um, options for folks to also receive individualized care um, if they need it. Um, so please um, email me if you have any other questions and uh, that's it, I'll stop sharing. Yeah, you are, and COPE, um, I see you up close. You are working so hard every day on meeting so many different requests and needs and it's an amazing and involving program. Um, thank you to everyone. COPE is by us partly and it's for us. So mm -hmm. we encourage everyone to, um, to use these services. This is, uh, you know, when you look at the disaster curve, we are living with, with grief, loss, vicariously, because so many others are worse off than us as well, as well as our personal situations at home. So do not underestimate the need to upgrade your wellness and your, you know, let's just say mental health habits. We all um, could probably, you know, use some new ideas. So new ideas, let's talk about work. Workplace shapes mental health. And I invite you all to, um, by the way, I'm talking to give you some time to uh, ask some questions or some interesting discussion questions about our department, about mental health and COVID. Um, this is a time we're going to unmute you all in a, in, a, in a minute. Before that, I'm going to give you an assignment. You have a little bit of a homework. So thinking about workplace, workplace shapes mental health. Aspects of work, such as um, having a flexible schedule, really improve ability for self-care, feeling good communication and uh, appreciation. What, what we heard from Keith is super important right now, now that we're really reliant on um, not in-person communications and you know, social interactions that would be easy to have where we can show gratitude for people. Showing gratitude uh, promotes trust and belongingness at work. So there's a lot of gratitude research and um, it's easy to ignore gratitude, but it's a big one that we know about. So let's just talk about that for a minute. When we show gratitude for people, it increases their feeling of purposeness and their work engagement. Now, um, I would like us all to think about one person in our work world doesn't have to be someone that's a peer. It could be someone who supports your role, who makes your life easier, makes your task easier, and send them a gratitude text or email. Um, as an example, I do a lot of grants at the, you know, should never be at the last minute, right? But I work intensely with these grant administrators and boy, is their job thankless. I mean, they work with me so hard and then they go on to the next person. So I'm always, I try to really show specific gratitude as well as tell their supervisor how well they did. Um, so when we think about staff whose role might be invisible, but they're supporting us, that's a huge, um, great target for your gratitude email. You can send a generic one, just saying that, you know, I'm sending you gratitude for all you do, or even better, very specific, really just saying, describing what they did precisely and how it helped you. That's the science, right? Pretty easy. Um, okay, but pretty powerful. So I want to open this up to, we have about 10 minutes, and I would like everyone unmuted. Okay, you can unmute yourselves. Um, and I would like to know what you are, um, how the, where this is landing on you. You've had a lot of information. We want us, you know, we want to think about ourselves, but we also want to think about our work uh, environment. We each have a microcosm of people we interact with all the time. We also have programs, centers, and we have a whole department. So what can we do together to improve some of our kind of resilience to this new way of living? You know, we're so flooded um, with invisible questions. I'm just going to say, speak up, just unmute yourself and talk. Let's see how that goes. Such a shy department. <laughs> Such a group of introverts. I'm just kidding. Oh, and you've been texting a lot. Well, let's hear from you. I actually don't have any questions. I really appreciate this webinar. It's great. Thanks. 
Thank you, Owen. Okay, I have a question. Um, I would like to know um, one thing that we can do as a department differently in the near future that something you might have thought of or you just thought of it right now. What's one thing we can all do together besides more town hall meetings? One thing that would make a difference. I know we all want information on what's next. Um, and that's something that our department doesn't have control over. That's Grand Central of UCSF. Nikki. Hi, um, this is beautiful, guys. I think one of the things I'm struggling with, I'm not sure what the answer is, but how we're gonna resolve the disparities in terms of who is on the front lines, meeting all of these demands psychiatrically within our department um, and others who have been in a position where they're working less or having more protected time because they're working from home on research, you know, not implying all researchers are not um, in a state of, of crisis, but there's a lot of variability in who is really intensely struggling with the current work climate. And then there's the added variability of who is dealing with caregiving issues at home and I think it would be great for us to think as a department, not necessarily on this call, but in the coming weeks and months about how we work to protect and ensure equity and impact of this COVID in the work that we're all doing. Because just the three of you guys talking about how intensely you've been supporting these needs, you know, is so amazing, actually, the four of you, including Keith. Um, and not everyone has been in a position to contribute in that way or, or has been able to. And then there's a lot of variability in um, who's balancing other demands at home. And so it would be great for us to think about how to, how to bring equity forward um, as it unfolds in the coming months. I'm not sure the answer. It's very complicated, of mm -hmm. course. Um, Nikki, or Nicole, I've never met you, so I don't know if I should be calling you Nikki. <laughs> but, Neither um, sign, Nikki. <laughs> um, I, I do just want to give a plug. Um, so when I do town halls, I usually have someone from our department join me. And some of them are people I've really only just met since I started doing COPE. And I, I have people join me for a couple of reasons. One, because I think it's just incredibly meaningful work and I feel super privileged to do it. And so I want to share that. And I just think it's a great opportunity to connect with other departments. But I also do it because I think it's so wonderful for our colleagues in other departments to experience how wonderful we are. <laughs> and um, just to plug just what a great resource our, our mental health providers are. So if anybody is interested um, ever joining me for a town hall, um, it's pretty minimal. It's like an hour and then I, I give you kind of stuff to say so it's not a big burden But if people would love to join me, please just send me an email Margo.pumar at UCSF and just let me know that you're interested um, and I'll keep a list of people because I think it would be great to have more people experience that and um yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And the opportunity is really wonderful. I'll also say, Nikki, you you know me. So um, I've definitely been thinking about this too. And we've been thinking about it on our leadership team in the department with Matt about how, um, how to think about it. I think, um, and address these complicated issues around um, uh, equity within our workforce. Um, and um, I also know that, you know, um, there's been early reports within uh, higher education about women um, being impacted differentially, um, uh, women within academia being impacted differentially by this epidemic because of these additional uh, caregiving responsibilities. And so um, I'll just say, I, I'm ad we're advocating at the top level, you know, working with um, uh, the the vice provost's office, et cetera, um, but also um, actively having discussions about this internally within our department uh, to think about that. Um, but uh, so it is a complex issue. And I think um, I know Matt's really dedicated to that. We're going to, that's a big one. We need to break it down. It, you, you know, you tap into a lot of things. I know that there's a lot of guilt also in certain um, 
you know, through our webinar, when we did moral distress, we got a tremendous number of MDs guilty because they're not frontline, because they're older or have health issues, et cetera. I'm not sure what we're, the landscape of inequity here, people have such different roles, as well as hit you know, their, their spouse might have lost their job, et cetera. So I think the, the financial piece, we don't know and understand, but it's um, very serious to many people. Owen had a question. Also, you, you don't need to all be, um, uh, your videos can come on now if you would like. I know I told you to take them off so that you could move, but um, we have five minutes together. So let's see you. Owen? Uh, thanks. I actually do have a question. Um, we're talking a lot about um, individuals calling into the CO program, which I think is a, a really, really wonderful resource. But some of the clinicians in the CO program, like, like myself, are trained in like psychopharmacology, but not so much in crisis counseling. Mm -hmm. And I think some in-depth counseling for the clinicians on how to be most effective in this role would be really welcome. That's such a great idea. I'm happy to um, pass that on to John and Michael. That's, that's great. Yeah, Keith, did you have any comment on that? What type of training, who would do it? Um, you know, I, I think I would need to, to think about it to give a really, like a really thoughtful response. I mean, I, um, I do think, again, I do think sometimes when we're faced with these massive situations, we forget what we know. Um, and part of, I think, doing a really good job is the, the human connection that, comes about in in you know having a uh, an interaction with um, a provider in you know in an intimate way where you're revealing what's really difficult for you. Um, you know we've we've you know some of my earlier writings with uh, Charlie Marmer and a few folks we kind of developed a a model for how one might do this after uh, the earthquake. Um, and so some of those principles probably still. Uh, apply and I know Matt was Matt was was texted about you know what happens uh, you know, after military uh, scenarios and and they use fa fairly similar kinds of things where there's a sort of a proximity to the event you provide folks with an opportunity you know and quickly after being exposed to something difficult um, you give them an opportunity to talk about it. You give them the expectation that things are going to get better, and that you keep the intervention simple, with uh, with really a, a an assumption that everybody's going to be okay. Um, and then, and through doing that, it helps you assess who may need more, which is, I think, probably like like a critical component to this is keeping in the back of your mind that somebody might actually need a little bit more than what you're than what you know you're initially talking with them about. So those are just some general comments. Thank you so much. Time for one more question. Time for silence together. That's lovely too. So you have bought yourselves one minute. I'm going to ask Matt to close us up and say goodbye. This has been wonderful to see everyone and have this discussion and this will be an ongoing discussion. Thank you. I just want to thank everyone. The talks were wonderful. Um, a ton of interesting stuff on the chat. I'm hoping we can preserve that. Um, Nicholas, somehow, uh, fingers crossed, I guess we've been recording. So um, uh, there's a bunch of interesting information there. I just want to thank everyone. And Alyssa, thank you so much for all the work that you've been doing and helping to organize this. Um, it feels to me like uh, we, we need to start thinking about when the next one of these will be. So we'll have that discussion. Thanks very much, everyone. Really appreciate it. Take care. Be well, everyone. Bye-bye.